I couldn't bring myself to work. I, I just found it unpleasant. I, I wasn't enjoying chess. I didn't want to even look at chess. You have to re get that confidence again that you are able to to win tournaments. Okay, these these two guys are incredibly strong. Uh, they're playing a world championship match, and I had there's no reason why I also can't potentially be there. Some things happened at the end that uh, I I told myself back then that I would never speak about it unless I become world champion. I don't know what that means. I don't know what seventy five percent cheating. Almost fell into the trap. <laughs> Hi guys, I've recently been to Samarkand where I've recorded a podcast with Fabiano Caruana, one of the greatest chess players ever and one of the strongest chess players currently in the world. Uh, he's also a fascinating personality. I love his podcast where he is able to break down complex uh, topics uh, related to chess, how the mind of chess players works, etc., etc. We have discussed many of those topics in this podcast episode. Uh, it has been a really deep, sincere conversation. I, I feel like uh, Fabiano has opened up about many topics, personal stuff. So uh, look, really looking forward to sharing this content with you. At the end of the episode, we have played a Blitz game with time odds. It was fascinating. Also, don't miss it. And subscribe to the channel because uh, there is a lot of other content coming up. For example, recently I've uploaded a podcast episode with Nepo. Check it out must watch. Also, a uh, podcast with Livon Aronian is coming up and many other pieces of content like my games against AIs with various in various formats. You are going to love it. Subscribe and enjoy this podcast episode. Let's go. Hi, everyone. My name is Greg Mastrider, and today here with me is one of the strongest chess players to ever live on this planet, the legendary Fabiano Caruana. Fabi, hi. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining in. Let's talk about you as a chess player, you as a personality, your attitude towards the latest chess news. There is lots to discuss. I'm a big fan of your podcast, Thank C you. Squared. Everyone, I recommend it. The link is in the description. I know that you have discussed many uh, cheating-related uh, topics recently, and we'll get to that. But first of all, I want to speak about uh, last year, which was uh, this year uh, as we're speaking which was uh, one of the most successful years for you over the recent history as a chess player. And uh, what's, what's the recipe? What's, uh, what's the ingredient that was missing previously? Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting question. Because uh, as a chess player, you go through periods where you have very bad form or very good form, and sometimes you don't know the reason. But I think for me, directly, this period is related to my motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for a number of years, I was struggling with motivation. Uh, I, I would say the pandemic, very strongly. Um, I mean, it made the chess world difficult. It made traveling difficult. Uh, well, it made life difficult in general. But uh, yeah, it was a very uncertain time. And so for this period, from starting from 2020, uh, when the candidates broke up, it was split into two parts from mm -hmm. uh, March 2020 to till even next year, the one which Jan Nepomnishi won. Uh, I basically didn't work from this period. After, the, after this candidates, uh, the first half finished, I didn't work for almost like a full year. Why? I couldn't bring myself to work. I, I just found it unpleasant. I, I wasn't enjoying chess. I didn't want to even look at chess. So what did you do? Um, <laughs> well, I mostly stayed at home and did nothing for a few months. And mm -hmm. uh, from like March, or I, I forget exactly when I got back, I guess like sometime in, in April, I got back to the United States for we were playing in Yekaterinburg. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't look at chess. I just stayed at home. I mean, we it was even difficult to go out. Uh, nothing was open, as, as I guess the whole world remembers quite clearly. And it's, of course, very good that we, we got over that. Uh, we got to a more, I mean, I, I won't say still the world is complicated, but at least this, this uh, part of the problems in the world uh, resolved. And um, yeah, so I, I just don't know why, but I couldn't bear to look at chess. Uh, I did at, I did prepare quite seriously for the second half of the candidates. So basically for like 10 days, mm. I prepared quite a lot, but like I wasted nine months and then after that, I was even thinking, uh, like, uh, do I want to play chess anymore? After the second half of the candidates, after it was clear that Jan had won the tournament and I, I wasn't going to play another match, at least for that time. Uh, and my rating was dropping. And I also felt, even though my rating still wasn't, uh, wasn't lower than other players, I started to feel like I was losing my edge over some players and I was uh, no longer superior to, to many guys who I felt superior in the past. 
Um, and in fact, I was starting to feel like some players were just playing better than me, like clearly. So I could feel this level drop before my rating caught up. Was and it to you who got weaker or them who got stronger? I think I got weaker. Mm -hmm. I think, in fact, many players got weaker, but I was definitely dropping perhaps more than others. I think the young players, they definitely got stronger, but I'm speaking more about my contemporaries like uh, like Jan, like Ding, like uh, who, who both challenged in the match, the last match, and like Anish and Wesley and so on. So I, I definitely lost my edge uh, and then my rating plummeted at some point. Uh, but that was, um, yeah, 2022, that was when my rating dropped quite a lot. And that was also a difficult period because I, I regained some motivation, but I think I worked even a little bit too hard in preparation for the candidates, which again, Jan won. So after losing to Magnus, he he came back and nobody expected that he would be able to repeat his success, or I think few people expected it, but he completely dominated the candidates. And uh, everything was going well in this tournament for me, like plus three at some point, yeah. was playing very well, um, but I had like a complete psychological collapse. Uh, but since then, I, something changed. I, I don't know what it was. Um, I regained my passion for chess, which was important, and that happened this year, sometime around April. Uh, I enjoyed working again. Did I'm you not do sure. anything on purpose to do the, to 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 this effect? Not really. I don't know what it was, but it just um, sometime around like May, I was just very motivated. I was working nonstop again, and uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I really wanted to like prove my success in some tournaments, and then I realized at some point that I even could do it. Like you have to re get that confidence again that you are able to to win tournaments. So the first tournament I won this year was the Bucharest Grand uh, Grand Chess Tour. It was right after I did the commentary for the last half of the match between Jan and between Ding, and I kind of watched this match in some amazement. I think many people did uh, because it, it completely it didn't follow at all the kind of trajectory that I expected. I was watching very closely all the games, and I kind of expected that Jan would win this match from the beginning. And I think most people, like looking at the early part of the match, they kind of thought Ding, and even hearing how he was talking about it. That, yeah, it was like one-way street. Yeah, it, that, that's how it felt. But still, the fight continued and continued, and there was so much drama at the end. Um, I mean, I guess you've, you've spoken to Jan, and, and he's gave, given a lot of... Uh, uh, details about this match. I mean, he could speak about it more than uh, better than anyone. But I, I just looked from the side in kind of some amazement, like uh, like I couldn't believe what I was seeing, you know. But I, I feel like it gave me some motivation because I felt like, okay, these these two guys are incredibly strong. Uh, they're playing a world championship match, and I had there's no reason why I also can't potentially be there. So, of course, I don't know if I will be there again, but at least I should fight for it. That was my that was my feeling. Mm -hmm. So that's what gave you motivation, seeing that. Uh, you can do better in such a match. Not even that I can do better, because uh, of course I understand the pressure. Like I know how how pressure it can ruin your uh, your chess. But against Magnus, uh, it didn't ruin your chess, or did it? I think in, in some match. games, in some games, you could feel it. Like mm -hmm. in the first game, from both of us. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is about this match. Like some things happened at the end that uh, I I told myself back then that I would never speak about it unless I become world champion. So I'm waiting for this day. If I never become world champion, then I'll never speak about it, what happened at the end of the match. <laughs> if I do, then I, then I will speak about it. But uh, of course, it, this match itself was uh, was some sort of trauma for me. Like I, I didn't kind of uh, realize it at the time. I felt like, okay, I'm going to bounce back. And uh, more or less, I guess I did the next year. I, I didn't play badly. But uh, but yeah, definitely this like resulted in some sort of trauma, which uh, which also dampened my motivation. Mm. So long term, this also influenced maybe that dip that happened later. I think so. But I, I think the 2020, the events of 2020 were more, um, perhaps more traumatic even. It's interesting how much in chess depends on psychology. So people tend to underestimate that, I think. Yeah, I think that's definitely true because a, a lot of the players in the world, the, the best players, they have more or less, uh, like we have very similar capabilities. Mm -hmm. Our top level is probably quite close to like the same. Like we can play a perfect game, uh, but we rarely do. And the reason, the question is why. Of course, there's so many factors that enter into a game. Why are you making mistakes? I think if you ask any player uh, who is like 2,700 plus, like why did you make this mistake? They'll of course. It's not. They'll realize it's a mistake yeah. after the game. Uh, you don't even have to like show them the computer very often. 
uh, very, very rarely are our mistakes due to like some lack of understanding. It of course happens, but more often than not, it's because of some lapse, some mental lapse, which um, is due to a variety of reasons. I think some could be psychological, some could be um, some like physical issues, some lapse of concentration, some tiredness at, at a particular moment. And we underestimate these things. This is what probably Magnus does. Um, besides, of course, his tremendous strength, what he does better than others is that he doesn't seem to, have, or he has them less than others, these kind of dips in, in form or during a game. Uh, are there ways to minimize uh, those moments, uh, staying in good shape? Yeah, I think there's there's ways to like mitigate the, the potential for them. Uh, definitely avoiding tiredness, because once you get tired, then of course your, your concentration is likely to, uh, is you're less likely to be able to keep concentration for a long period. So, so certainly like some physical fitness is important and, and some like mental, let's say mental fitness as well, making sure that you're, you don't have a million things on your mind. You're not thinking about all the problems in the world or on all your, your personal problems potentially, but about just the game in front of you. And well, this is a very personal thing because of course, mm -hmm. everyone has a, so many things going on in their life, you know? Uh, you could be going through a relationship trouble. You could be worried about the events of uh, of the world in general, as uh, especially like in these internet times. I mean, you, we see so much news, and of course, some of it is is either distracting or or disturbing. Um, so yeah, there's a million things which can go wrong. Keeping a clear head is is definitely a, a part of being a professional chess player. Do you consider yourself good at that? I've heard recently a story from a friend of mine who is a theatrical director. Uh, uh, she, she directs drama and uh, an actor, a f an acquaintance of his, uh, uh, lost his dad on the day he was cast, uh, uh, he was to play the main role in an important uh, play, in drama uh, comedy not even drama, but comedy. And he was uh, exceptionally good. Even uh, though his dad just died, he made all the audience laugh because that's the level of professionalism required for an actor. Um, if we consider chess players, if we consider you, are you capable of delivering in spite of any external circumstances, staying calm? Sometimes, I, I don't think I'm the best at it. Uh, I, I did have like one personal tragedy, similar to, to what you just mentioned. Uh, in 2013, during the tournament, my, my grandmother passed away. Mm -hmm. And so I, well, I continued playing the tournament. Uh, I finished the tournament and it wasn't very good for me. I didn't, I didn't play well. Um, also, around the same time, someone in my family was having some serious health issues. Someone, someone very close to me in my family. And um, yeah, this was, this was a difficult period. Uh, so. Things like that, yeah, they can really take, um, yeah, I mean, they take your mind off chess. You realize that, of course, playing a board game is maybe not the most important thing in the world. Uh, it's difficult to keep professionalism. I, I think that's, yeah, some players manage it better than others. They're able to, like, shut things out. I think when I'm at the board, I do more or less shut things out. Mm -hmm. Like, it's very immersive when you're playing a, a really stressful or tense chess game, a really important one. You do kind of get immersed and you forget about everything else in the world, at least for that period. But there's also the period before the game um, being able to prepare for hours, potentially being able to concentrate on finding ideas for your, against your opponents, or, you know, just not thinking, like not having that stress in your mind constantly, like it, perhaps in the evening you have to relax or do something to take your mind off stress or about, or off chess, but you don't want something that's weighing on you constantly. What do you do to relax? Very often I've just relaxed with movies in the evening. That's been my like go-to, uh, something which I, I just shut my mind off. I don't have to like, think about, think about things too much. Uh, very often for chess players, sports is, is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a rest day during a tournament, usually chess players, maybe I, maybe I won't say usually, but very often chess players will go to sports, whether it's football or tennis. I mean, for me, tennis has always been the sport that I kind of enjoy, at least for, for about six years now. Although I'm not good at all, but I do enjoy it. Which level are you? No, I, I'm, I don't have a level. I mean, I can play. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Yeah, I don't have a level. I would. Uh, that's already a level. I, I would not be confident to play that's against a difficult uh, sport. Yeah, yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, actually, playing it was was when I realized it would make me appreciate how amazing like the professional players are. Because mm -hmm. when you play, that's when yeah. you realize just how Agreed. difficult this is. Not even like the really tough stuff that they do, but just like the the basic stuff is so difficult. Agreed. I'm similar level, so I can relate.
But I, yeah, I think this is also a great way. Sports, you mm-hmm. know. Um, but you also work out. Yeah, um, but I don't have the motivation during tournaments. So I, I do when I'm at home. And at some point, I, like when I pick it up again, then I get motivated and I, I'm able to keep a routine. But during tournaments, I just can't do this. I think, let's say a guy like Magnus, he, he actually works out during tournaments as well. He keeps some sort of physical fitness, which is good. I, I just wasn't able to kind of compartmentalize things where I can work out and uh, and also work on chess seriously. Mm, okay. But that should help probably, right? To like take your mind off, uh, off the game, not obsessively think about lines all the yeah time. yeah it definitely helps um i've tried to keep something up recently like some morning workouts mm-hmm. which i think like during rapid and blitz events it's very convenient because you don't have to work on chess so much you don't have to prepare so much for these faster time controls and so i'm able to do something kind of stress relieving in the morning some exercise uh, like intensive exercise you basically stop thinking about everything else right you can only mm-hmm. think about getting through this and i think that's very good because you t- it takes your mind off of everything at least for a short period Well, f- during a chess tournament, like your mind is constantly engaged. I mean, you're always thinking about yeah. the next game. So I'll probably be able to see you in the hotel's uh, uh, gym <laughs> in the morning. Yeah, may- uh, maybe. Actually, that would be a good idea. But you know, I, I, I really like enjoy, I think this like Eastern cultures, they have this, which Americans just don't do this at all, which is like uh, spa, sauna, yeah. um, hammam and, and all these things. Uh, Americans absolutely don't do this. Like in my city, I can't find a sauna. Um, but it's something that I really love to do as well. But uh, recently it has gotten s- some popularity due to biohacking movement, I think. Yeah. Called, uh, yeah. Cold bath, exposure. Cold exposure. Yeah. This is something I, I enjoy quite a lot. Um, I tried it, uh, cold baths. Ah. Uh, again, it's, it's very expensive in the U S that's the thing. Like they have this cryotherapy. Mm-hmm. I've looked into it. It does get really expensive. So I kind of have my own makeshift like ice bath, which I, I do myself. But you've been to Russia, you've been to Russian sauna. Yeah, this is very nice. Have I think. you dived into snow? Uh, after? Well, not the snow, but I haven't done this, but I've done the cold plunge after, yeah, yeah. Also which is snow. similar, but yeah. I, this I really enjoy. I haven't done the like really rustic, like go from sauna straight into the, the snow in winter, which I guess is <laughs> probably very difficult. Yeah, I can. Uh, it, it's not actually. You, uh, you feel hot from the inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When, when you go out, you don't even feel the cold uh, initial time. Really recommend it. Um, okay, uh, we've talked a little bit about your uh, routine for staying on top of your game. Uh, what about your work on chess uh, improvement? Uh, how many hours per day on average do you spend working on chess? And how is that time split between uh, different uh, types of activities? Well, that depends a lot on if I'm working on my own or with someone else. When I'm working on my own, I, I basically can't bring myself to do some kind of work, which isn't opening work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't really have the, well, I mean, when I was a kid, I did this constantly, right? I would just sit at, at a board for like three hours calculating some position. This was like my training and, and definitely it's very beneficial. But at some point, uh, yeah, you don't really want to do this anymore. So mostly on my own, I, I look for opening ideas. And sometimes this is very relaxed work. You kind of turn on the engine mm-hmm. and it tells you it's, it's not maybe the most romantic thing to say, but it kind of just tells you basically what the position is about. And then you kind of search for some creative ideas, which can trick your opponents. And then you have, um, let's say different type controls have their own uh, demands. So for a classical game, I know that I, what kind of ideas I might be looking for. And for a Raptor Blitz game, it's much more wide, it, especially for Blitz. Basically in Blitz, you can do whatever you want. You can get very creative, which is kind of fun. And, um, and also this is why I think my blitz results at someone improved because I started to think a little bit about what to play in these games in the opening. All right. So you have, uh, consciously, uh, started picking, uh, lines for, uh, for blitz games. Particularly. Yeah. Well, I've been thinking like, what, what am I willing to play or what, what in this tournament am I interested in? And, uh, if you have no idea what you're going to play in the opening in a blitz game, it, you can actually turn very badly. Mm. So the opening is an important part, but it's, it's sort of like, you just want to get a, a good head start. You don't want to get a bad position. You're always on the back foot and yeah, maybe you'll escape, but maybe not. And I think this is what many players do, uh, especially top player like Magnus, for example, you can see that his ideas are very suited for what he's uh, aiming for in the game. He has ideas for rapid, he has ideas for blitz. Explain the difference for, um, those who don't understand it, uh, from our audience, uh, I, our ideas for blitz, uh, 
necessarily those that can be more dubious but uh, difficult to uh, disprove in short time uh, period or how does it work yeah it's uh, so you yeah you can play lines which are objectively dubious because you know that your opponent will not be able to to refute them so very often the idea is just to get something fresh mm -hmm. and something where your your plans are a little bit more clear cut than your opponents uh, so there are some openings where a bit where that's a bit more suited and also um if it's a bit off the beaten track, then you know that your opponent will be less familiar with it. So you're probably going to get a head start in terms of knowing the position a bit better, being a bit up on time, and also uh, knowing the plans better, and your opponent will probably make a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's very unlikely that your opponent, if you know it and they don't, that they're going to uh, approach the position in the correct way. So yeah, you, you can definitely, like, I'll give an example. Uh, at some point, Magnus was um, playing the Pirates very, mm -hmm. uh, very often in blitz and rapid chess and at a very serious level like you could tell there was a lot of preparation that went into this so i don't know his approach to working if he's like more or less delegating this to his second or to his helpers or if he does this work himself perhaps but you can see that there is a lot of opening knowledge and a lot of work behind his his openings so like the kind of narrative that he he just kind of goes there and plays this is completely false and nobody does this there's not a single player who is uh, just sitting down at the board, completely fresh. I mean, okay, sometimes you, sometimes you play some stuff which is a bit less uh, uh, correct than than other times. Uh, and yeah, definitely blitz and rapid uh, allow this freedom, which makes it kind of more enjoyable. I think this is another reason why players enjoy blitz and rapid more. Mm -hmm. uh, are you willing to uh, go to positions where you are objectively slightly worse, but that are? Off the beaten path, so to say, in blitz. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and the thing is, I think there was a realization for me at some point that, like these terms, like slightly worse or much worse, uh, they're kind of subjective terms. I mean, objectively, chess has three results, and each position with correct play will lead to one of those three results, and we don't really know exactly. So these are kind of like um, this is a way to guide our our feel feeling of the position. If I tell you that a position is 0 0.3 by the engine, of course, this has no meaning. Um, this probably means that the position is objectively a draw. But when you see this number, you shouldn't think, I need, I need to get this or I need to avoid this. You should think, um, is this position easier to play for me than for my opponent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, generally speaking, I do find that if a position, if the engine is saying that there is some advantage for, for your side, probably this does mean that the position is easier to play for you. Because usually this means that there's many paths to an acceptable position, while your opponent usually has less paths to an acceptable position. Perhaps they have like two moves which uh, lead to an old position and then a, a number of moves which lead to uh, a serious disadvantage. So this is a kind of like way that I think we should be looking at chess. Um, but these numbers are just, well, this is just like a programming thing, right? For for us, us as, as human players, we, we don't really think about this at the board. I mean, maybe more so these days, people actually think like, okay, this is maybe point four or People sometimes talk like this, like this is definitely a plus five position. Yeah, this is completely winning. But um but objectively, yeah, we we should think about chess in terms of uh is this position easier to play, is it more practical, is this winning, is this losing, and so on. Okay, let's uh, get back to the topic of what you do now. So you said that uh, on your own, you can only bring yourself to do openings and uh, while uh, with your team, you also do some other things, right? Yeah, still the main focus when I'm working with a group of people is opening work. But then uh, there's a lot of other stuff, which can be tied to opening work. For example, you can play training games, you can play Rapture Blitz games in opening, which is interesting. Then you get a human feel for how the position looks. Mm -hmm. Not because, the, of course, looking at the engine, it really colors your knowledge, of, your feeling of the position, your knowledge of the position. If you just started fresh, then you can see what's like the natural human intuition. You can also see, like, will this idea work? Will someone be more likely to make a mistake against this move or in this position? So, and also it's more fun to play in training games. Like people get competitive. Usually I'm going to be training against very strong players myself. And so, of course, there's that element of competition and uh, everyone's motivated. And then there's, of course, yeah, I was trying to solve studies or trying to solve positions. Um, it's usually people get bored doing that, I find. Uh, it's very rare that I, I meet someone who really can like, um, kind of focus in and just try to solve the study from beginning to end. Very, very rare quality. I used to do, do this very often when I was younger, 
Um, I still try to keep some discipline when I'm solving. But yeah, of course, with age, it kind of uh, you lose your kind of focus and when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. But everybody says that you are the strongest uh, human calculator uh, in chess. Do you agree with them? Um, I think at some point I was probably calculating better than anyone. I'm not sure about these days. Um, these days I'm relying a bit more on feeling, uh, a bit more on intuition. Still, I feel like when I need to calculate, I can, um, I can do it well. But I don't think I can do it as well as when I was younger. I think that this is like with age, things change. You get better at certain things, you get worse at certain things. So my calculation mm -hmm. ability, I think, has gone down. But definitely at some point, my calculation ability, I think, driven by a few factors, was was probably better than anyone's. Mm -hmm. Did you train it on purpose, uh, like uh, extensively many hours every day? Well, as a kid, I did. Okay. Uh, I think I have like a natural ability to do so, mm -hmm. and and I have some qualities which are just very good for it. Um, to start with, I, I'd have a lot of discipline. I think this is probably a result of training as a young kid that I'm very disciplined in my calculations, so I don't stop short. So of course, uh, during a game, many people can calculate fully, but uh, that they have the actual discipline, like the, they have something in their mind that always tells them, like, don't stop mm -hmm. until you're absolutely sure, this is very rare even among top players, I believe, that very often people stop short in their calculations. And now I tend to do that a bit more, but at some point I was basically never stopping short. This would lead sometimes to like overspending in time, mm -hmm. but um, it would also allow me to like go deeper into some positions. And the other quality I had in terms of calculation was that I, I would consider moves that other people wouldn't consider. So I was kind of like my, um, like searching in a position for like candidate moves, I was, for like very open-minded and I wouldn't mm. exclude moves on principle. So I think those two qualities allowed me to, um, to yeah, perhaps calculate better than others. Do you recommend that to ordinary chess players uh, to not uh, uh, just throw away some uh, non-obvious candidate moves? It depends. I think there is no like one solution for anyone. Um, when we're talking about like the ordinary chess player, I don't think that this is a very important thing. Mm -hmm. um, like, let's say we're talking about players from the rating range of 1500 to 2000, for example, this, this class of players, um, yeah, this is not going to be really important. Like calculation is not going to play a huge role in general. It's mostly going to be about tactics. Mm -hmm. Uh, just tactical vision is, is the most important thing and finding positions that you're comfortable to play, play with that. That's, that's my feeling, even though I'm not a coach, um, in terms of like calcul like making the difference between uh, someone who's like 2680 and 2740 then these kind of finer details become more relevant because then the, the difference is very small. It's based on, um, yeah, just like one, two details in a game very often. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, drew a line between uh, calculation and tactics. Isn't that uh, closely related? It's, it's definitely closely related, but calculation is going to refer to like a, a comprehensive search in a position, uh -huh. which is, um, so tactics are, are just short sequences. Um, yeah, in this position, I have like a two move sequence that wins material or leads to an advantage. Uh, this is like super important in fast time controls. The, uh, if you look at, for example, Magnus, one of his best skills, which really aids him in, in, for example, blitz chess is that he has excellent tactical vision. The same with Tikaru, um, just for like really, really sharp tactically, not missing almost anything. Yeah. Uh, calculation is a bit different. This doesn't help you in fast time controls. I mean, nobody sits down and calculates like a 10 move sequence so where there's like a lot of branching options so for example you have a position and then you have a branch of three moves and then you calculate for example the first branch but this branch also has a few branches so kind of um this is more like organizational work yeah got it do you visualize those branches while calculating oh yeah of course as um, branch ceiling yeah i i do kind of see it so there's i think there's a few ways to kind of look at it during a game like to organize your calculation um, one is kind of to start at one branch. This is, uh, I think, the like Koto method. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like you have candidate moves. So I have A, B, C, D. So I start with A. I go to N. I make my conclusion about the A, and then I go to B, mm -hmm. and then C and D, and then I make my choice. Um, I don't think this is like really the most efficient because uh, first of all, these moves are very often connected. So let's say I go down A, and then I realize something, uh, and then I can actually use this to like. Um, in, a, in another branch, because mm. the position will, of course, have similarities. Like, let's say there's a detail here, but if I just change one thing, 
then then suddenly B works. Hmm. So I think the most efficient method from what I found is that I kind of more or less look at A, B, C, D uh, quickly and equal debt. Mm -hmm. And then I go back to A, for to, example. To go into... To go deeper. More. Yeah. It, and if, for example, I like A a lot, like this I think looks really good, maybe I can just discard the rest of the moves. This already looks good enough to me because I need to preserve time. I can't just spend all my time on one moment. Mm -hmm. If A doesn't uh, look good to me, then I'll start to look at alternatives. Um, what very often happens is a bit chaotic. I just like look at A, to feel a bit wrong about that, then suddenly look at another move and you're not really sure. And so I, I wouldn't say that it's always as organized as I describe, like the thought process during a game. But um, but more or less, this is how I would I would kind of categorize how I calculate. Thanks, that's very valuable because for me uh, it's always very chaotic, and to try and to start looking at A and then I come to some idea about B and. <laughs> but this this is also helpful in some in some ways. I think sometimes you need a little bit of uh, like you can't have everything strictly just like I, I need to go through these options in order. Like sometimes this kind of chaotic process is not bad because, um, well, first of all, we're not, we're not perfect, right? We, we're going to, uh, we're not machines. Yeah? We're, we're going to be looking at things a bit more from a human perspective. And also it, it's a bit more creative. Like you, let's say you look at one line for, for a few seconds and then you just realize something about the position. Like it just helps your intuition and it can actually aid in your feeling for like which move is correct. Mm -hmm. At least that's, that's what I think. It's interesting that you mentioned that uh, people at the top are very closely matched uh, by skill, but you also mentioned that people have their own strengths, like Magnus has uh, some, you have others. How would you compare yourself, Magnus, Hikaru, and let's take, let's take also Jan, uh, Wesley, and Dane, let's take those players. Uh, which uh, strengths and which weaknesses do, all, uh, do each of you have? So I, I think the first thing is that uh, when I say strengths and weaknesses, of course, everyone is pretty pretty strong in all categories from this group of players that you mentioned. So it's going to be kind of small differences in this um, uh, in between these players, yeah, in in different categories. But if we're like speaking broadly, then I'm probably in a category with Ding, for example. Like we're 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 kind of calculators. We we uh, don't have too many biases about positions. Uh, we kind of go through things with a concrete approach. This is also like more or less how a young generation is approaching things. Mm -hmm. My weakness has always been like so my tactical vision is not too great. Um, I don't like to kind of spot tactics instantly in one second. This is not my uh, this is not not my strength. This probably hurts me a little bit in, for example, bullet. Mm. Um, but it's not it's not like a enormous weakness in most time controls. It's not something that you can really exploit. You know, it's kind of like in the heat of the moment. Maybe I'll miss some tactics that Hikaru or Magnus would see. So if we're talking about like Magnus, just kind of his intuition is, is like really, really excellent. I mean, he more or less uh, has his evaluative function, like he evaluates positions pretty correctly most of the time. His first instinct is is correct. I, I think I also have like a very good evaluation, like more or less I understand where I'm standing in the game. So uh, I, I feel like when I'm worse after the game, I kind of know where my mistake was or if I don't feel like there was a mistake or a serious mistake, my opponent's mistake. Uh, unless it's complete chaos, like sometimes you have these chaotic games where you, nobody understands what's going on and it's a bit random, right? For example, my game against Furusha recently from Singfield Cup is an example of that. A mm -hmm. little bit of chaos on mm -hmm. the board. Speaking of, for example, Jan, I think he's sort of also the category of players who have like a very, very good natural feeling. Like also he's helped a lot by his confidence. So he puts enormous pressure on people by playing quickly and confidently and at a pretty high level. So he can play at a high level quickly, which many people can't do. Um, but this sometimes le leads to some superficiality. Uh, sometimes it backfires. Yeah. Like with Dean. Yeah. Some, some rush decisions that, uh, it's hard to say, like, don't do this to someone because it's in some ways also a strength, right? To be able to put pressure and play quickly. And there's also moments where I would take my time and he wouldn't, and, uh, it wouldn't work out for me because I shouldn't take time at this moment. But sometimes I would take my time and I would find something that he would miss, which could be important. So how, how do you know when to take time? That's, uh, well, this is intuition. Yeah. But y you can't, um, yeah, there's no like one solution for this one. And um, you mentioned Wesley, I think, as well. Yeah. Wesley's a bit of a mysterious player because when you speak to him after the game, he kind of says things in very simple terms. 
like almost like he's talking to a beginner. He's a teacher and he's trying to explain things to a beginner. Mm -hmm. So he'll say things like, yeah, in this position, bishops attacked. Oh yeah. In this position, of course, uh, like knight is going to go there. Like very, I don't know how to explain it exactly, but he speaks in things in like very, very basic terms. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's, it's very clear that he kind of calculates really well and he spots tactics really well. And his weakness, if you can like point to a weakness, because he's a pretty well-rounded player, and I don't think he has big weaknesses, um, are mostly probably due to some psychological factors and like lack of flexibility and um, lack of aggressiveness. Like some of the qualities that, for example, Magnus has, he very clearly lacks. Like, yeah, he's, he's always trying to look for his chance. And not everyone has this quality, but definitely Magnus is the one who has it the best. Mm -hmm. Does he have weaknesses, Magnus? Oh yeah, I think like even clear weaknesses. I mean, everyone has clear weaknesses, but um, in in some kind of like dynamic positions, you can outplay him. It's not easy. It's not like he's going to make mistake after mistake. But if you see how he loses games or how he gets outplayed, um, it's usually in these kind of uh, dynamic positions. Uh, why? What? What does he lack? Like uh, understanding of such positions or what? No, I, I wouldn't say he lacks understanding any aspect. Again, we're, we're talking about Magnus, so of course it's like, um, yeah, we're, we're talking about arguably either greatest or second greatest player in the history. Um, so of course these are like very small weaknesses if he has them. But definitely, if you get to a certain position, that he can be outplayed. It's not. Um, I don't think it's even so so much of a secret because you kind of see it that he's. The thing is, Magnus is like never playing tight chess. Mm -hmm. A guy like Wesley, he plays extremely tight. He goes for positions he knows well. He, uh, he, you basically have to try to get him out of his comfort zone. It's very difficult because he's playing the same openings, same, same types of positions. positions. <laughs> yeah, he's played them for years and he knows them super well. He knows them better than anyone. And to get him out of his comfort zone is super difficult. Magnus is, in some ways, I I'm similar. We basically play everything and we go for an open fight in every game. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's going to be times when Magnus plays stuff that he just doesn't really know that well, because you can't know everything. He's playing openings that he's studied, maybe a little bit, he has some idea, but he doesn't know them perfectly well in the same way that he hasn't played these positions for years. And that's where he, he's kind of trying to take you out of your comfort zone, but he's also not fully in his. And that's where he could potentially get outplayed. So uh, that's why, like recently, I played two matches against him, uh, four games each, yeah. and it went to Armageddon. So we played. Uh, we took played totally ten games. It was very exciting. I watched the stream. <laughs> I was I was kind of enjoying it, but I, I I didn't ever even when I lost the game, I didn't feel like I have no chance. You were outplaying him in most games. Uh, it it seemed. Well, yeah, it was kind of weird. I, I was very happy that we were taking it to a very open fight. So he wasn't shying away from battle with either color. And I think my main mistake was at some point I tried to play as a like very drawish line mm -hmm. in one game in the third game of a second match. Um, it was the only time I did it, and I we went to an endgame, which he kind of had some small idea. It's very safe for White. He was slightly better, and this is kind of this is his zone, right? You don't want to go to the, these positions where he's slightly better in, in a technical position. You're probably not going to face anyone more da more dangerous than him. So this was my mistake, and the, the next day Wesley repeated the mistake against him, played the same opening, and same outcome. Yeah, he should have played like he did in the Armageddon uh, sacrifice and the tech. Yeah, yes, Magnus. Well, this is this is how you have to play. It's not comfortable. It's not fun. But this is how, if you want to beat him, then you you have to do this. While some other guys, you can try to dry the game out, perhaps. But against him, drying the game out is not really a strategy. Uh, he recently, I mean, Magnus recently said in an interview to Levy, I think, that he considers you to be the second best uh, player in the world. However, by performance rating this year, for example, you were the best player in the world. How do you rank yourself in the world currently? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think it's very close at the moment, and it's also a kind of tumultuous period. And the reason why is because we used to only play classical chess, and now we play all sorts. Uh, I would even say more. I play rapid and blitz in classical, and even not just that, but sometimes we play Fisher random chess. Uh, so, uh, and even bullet, which I don't take seriously, but even that, I played some bullet this year. So. Everyone is focusing on different, different types of chess, so I don't think that we should only look at classical, which is what you mentioned my performance was the best this year, but we should look at all forms of chess uh, as a whole. I think this is also probably what Magnus is, uh, is saying. And 
as a whole, then Magnus is playing the best um, in terms of, let's say, rapid chess, blitz chess, and classical chess combined. He's still playing the best this year. Um, so when I rank the year, I, I, I think, okay, three players clearly come to the top, and we all have different um, sort of achievements, yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's Magnus, Hikaru, and me. Uh, for Magnus, he won the World Cup. It was probably the most difficult and, um, let's say, most rewarding event. Like, if I could pick one event to win this year, I would, well, I would either pick Rapid or Blitz World Championship or World Cup. But I would think World Cup would actually be kind of the pinnacle of like the event to win. Uh, he he also had a lot of success in Rapid and Blitz events, but this is, let's say, his main success. Uh, for Hikaru, he won the American Cup. Mm -hmm. uh, he, Norway. he also won Norway Chess. And he had to kind of undefeated, like very stable, like the most stable year was by him. And I won the most tournaments of the year uh, and had the highest performance. But in Rapid and Blitz, I was behind Magnus, like clearly behind. So then you can decide your ranking based on these stats, but I think that this is kind of the, the clear picture of what happened. Are you to some extent motivated by proving that you are, uh, you can be number one undisputed so that... Uh, uh, <laughs> Magnus no longer says this and you say that, well, Magnus is currently the second best player in the world. Uh, I, yeah, I do have my ambitions to be the top ranked in the world, uh, but it's not the main ambition at the moment. So for some people, the rating is the most important. For some, the world championship is the most important. And that's for me, that's my goal. And Magnus, as far as we know, is not planning to participate in the world championship cycle. Yeah. Although he still can play the candidates, it's still within yeah, his. That would be fun. <laughs> he said he wouldn't. We we can well we'll know soon. I think mm -hmm. it'll it'll be decided soon. He'll have to either accept or decline. Let's imagine a hypothetical scenario. Uh, you win the candidates, and then you uh, get the win over Dean and get the chess crown. The situation could be compared to I don't know Karpov becoming world champion while Fisher was still at his uh, peak, his prime. Uh, would you uh, challenge Magnus to a match, or what would you do to, to prove that you are number one in that case? Well, if this happens, I would, of course, be very open to a match with Magnus. Um, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't shy away from it. I would not play him under like the official title, mm -hmm. because I think that he would have to... Uh, well, in general, I, I don't believe in like champion's privilege or anything, or like Magnus' privilege. Like you, you need to qualify. Yeah. Even if you're Magnus, even if you're the best player in the world, you need to qualify because you need to prove. Uh, like I can say, in 2020, I was the highest rated in the candidates, but well, I have to still win and I have to prove it. And in fact, Jan was the one who who won that tournament, even though I was maybe 80 points higher rated than him at that time. So, um, but if we were playing like an unofficial match, of course, I would be very open to it. And I think that what would be most interesting would be, of course, a mix of classical, rapid, and blitz. Like, this is the most interesting mix of formats to decide if two players who is superior. And chess boxing. That would be well, even more. Okay. I'm not quite in his weight category, so <laughs> I don't know if this is so fair. <laughs> or I liked uh, uh, this smelly chess also. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a nice This format. is Christian's idea. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, let's discuss the latest uh, news with Kramnik. As of the date of this recording, he got banned from the chess.com block platform for expressing his concerns. Some say allegations uh, regarding cheating. You have spoken a lot about this in, uh, on your podcast. I will not ask you to reiterate everything. I just wanted to ask you, um, do you believe that it is uh, possible at all to combat cheating or are we heading to the times where more and more grandmasters stop playing chess online because of all this stuff? Yeah, this is a very difficult question. So my thoughts on this are kind of constantly evolving because I do think about it a lot. I, I think about what cheating a lot and what it will mean for chess. It's not my job to, of course, decide to, let's say, cheating measures or to ensure safe uh, playing tournaments. This is the job of organizers. But um, but it's in my interest to ensure safe play. So I talk to organizers as well, and um, and that's why my thoughts are kind of changing. Um, so when it comes to what Kramnik says, I think that he's right on many things, and he's also right in spirit. Uh, like, his concern is is valid. I don't think he's right about everything. And I think in, in the current moment, he's going in the wrong direction. Um, because there's kind of... There's 
more serious examples and more clear examples than what what he's going for. Um, he said, well, he said that Hikaru is 75% cheating. To start with, I don't know what that means. I don't know what 75% cheating is. And I think um, what he is saying it comes from a misunderstanding of of his statistics. And he's conflating different statistics, mm -hmm. statistical models. Uh, he's looking at the chance that someone will achieve a result in a given series of games. And he's conflating this with the chance that someone's cheating. But these are separate issues. So uh, I, I think maybe like Grishuk, I watched his, I call it a lecture, I guess. Ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the I, I think he had a more, he had a better idea of like what we should be talking about. Uh, in terms of, let's say, what can be done for cheating, I think online is um, more or less hopeless. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's a way to do it, uh, to, to save online chess, mm. to make sure, to ensure that it's safe. I think with online chess, basically, you kind of have to run on an honor system, and clearly the honor system is not working. Uh, over the board chess is a more, uh, yeah, this is a, like something that you can actually potentially protect against, but it's very difficult. Because as technology increases, um, yeah, there there are ways to cheat if you are if you have the will, mostly. So again, we're kind of running on an honor system, but there are ways also to combat this. So I'll, I'll just give like a, a short picture of what let's say FIDE uh, does. So the first thing is that metal detectors they only detect metal. So there's uh, there's ways to let's say hide a device which isn't metal. Yeah. Um, they use uh, a device uh, which. Um, Detects basically if there is like something which is conducting an electrical. Uh, it's called a nonlinear junction scanner, so it kind of detects if there's some sort of uh, electrical signal. And uh, this is one device, and then they also use thermal scanning because they're even worried that uh, people are going to implant things under their skin. And if we're talking like if we're talking about what is actually achieved by technology, if you don't do anything. Uh, like there's ways to connect, um, let's say, a small computer, which you can actually feed it data yourself uh, on your body. Mm -hmm. like you can uh, you can kind of transmit data, and people have done this, and then it all it transmits the moves back to you. Yeah. So it, this Wait, is actually like tooth, like something like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it could be that. It, it could be something with just like wires strapped to your leg, for example, and. Uh, and I think there was one player who did that and was caught mm -hmm. because at some point the, the apparatus was discovered. But this was a, like a one-way system, so he didn't need a, a, a second person. And and then it get, basically gives you the best move at the board. So you can be sitting at the board, and you can have a device on you. And of course, when you're in person, like people can actually check. Yeah, people can can check your body. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're at home, like what what is to prevent that? This is why cameras don't matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, they kind of help a little bit because they they weed out the, like the very basic stuff, which is just people ch like um, no cameras. People just start checking their phone potentially, uh, but cameras can't protect against that. They can't protect against an earpiece with a second person. You can't check someone's ears on on camera. You just won't. I mean, first of all, they're hidden earpieces. You can't see it. And um, in Norway, chess, for example, there was a doctor who was actually checking our ears with an instrument. Wow. Uh, only once. They only did this once during the tournament, but it was, I forget if during the game or, or before the game, they checked our ears with, uh, yeah, like this doctor's, I don't forget what it's called exactly. Stethoscope, something like the that. Stethoscope is when they check your your heartbeat, yeah? Uh, no, uh, so but uh, yeah, I, I, I forget, I, I, yeah, yeah. This, I this, this device. And um, so, yeah, you can have hidden ear pieces with the second person. And uh, the problem with like over the board is you can't jam signals. I think in most countries, most places, it's not legal to do this. I think they did this during the 2006 World Championship between Kremnik and Tepal. Mm -hmm. They actually jammed a signal mm -hmm. because they were in Elista, and I guess uh, well, Kirsan was present, and they had carte blanche to do what they want. <laughs> but um, so yeah, online chess. It's like I don't know what that person is doing. Even if you have a proctor there, which is probably the safest option to actually have an arbiter go to someone's home, also the most expensive option, you still can't protect against things. Because first of all, you have to trust the arbiter that they actually do a good job. And I had some experience with proctors who were kind of careless. Like I once played a tournament, Fisher Random World Championship 2019, it started online. Mm. In Spain, a Spanish arbiter came, and basically he was like the biggest fan. Uh, so. I actually had to ask him, like, do you want to see this? Do you want to check this? Because, like, I read the regulations. You should check the bathroom. You should yeah. inspect it. He was like, no, 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 it's fine. I trust you. Yeah. <laughs> no, basically, yeah. So this is one issue. The other issue is that 
again, if you have like some sort of sophisticated apparatus, uh, is a proctor really going to know how to search for this? Yeah, and then if we actually get into like the really high tech stuff, which I don't know if anyone's ever done. Yeah, I mean, if FIDE is worrying about like devices under the skin, um, you can never protect Brain against implants. Okay, <laughs> that's what we're done now. Yeah. <laughs> if if we have like some Elon Musk uh, mm -hmm. moment, then yeah, we're completely done in terms of protecting against cheating. But that that's my current um, stance on like how to protect against it. And in terms of Kremnik suspicions, I think that uh, the the problem is that he's going in the wrong direction in terms of what to suspect. Um, but it, it's clear that in general, let's take Title Tuesday. Uh, a tournament where there's uh, mostly no cameras, although the, the the website can ask and does ask people to go on camera if they feel like it's necessary. Um, but if they feel it's necessary, perhaps this the damage has already been done, like someone has already been cheating, and then they can stop cheating, but they already kind of damaged the tournament, they, they lifted their results up, they lowered the results of someone else. The amount of money which has been stolen, I think, is not insignificant. This is why I, I can't really name names, because it's actually like serious. Um, yeah. accusations because there are people who have won hundreds of thousands of dollars and I, I'm i sure that not all of them are clean. Um, like, like really sure. This is really frightening. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about like real theft uh, yeah. when it comes to online chess. Uh, but it's it's really rampant in these online events. With cameras, it's less rampant, but we, we don't know how much. Which is why you stopped playing Title Tuesdays. Uh, well, I didn't stop. Almost. I mean, I, the thing is, I, I take it kind of... Um, not as a tournament to like win anymore, but just to get some games in. Mm -hmm. okay. um, sometimes I get frustrated and I leave midway. I haven't won one in like very long time. Uh, I, I more or less average that I play like two cheaters per tournament. That's more or less the, the average that I'm quite sure about. This is crazy. Let's hope that people think of something, maybe some complex AI detection system, even though they will invent AI avoidance system for this detection system yeah. after this. This is like cat and mouse. I think this is like maybe AI will will improve to an extent that it can it can tell, but I'm not sure if this will ever be reached. Maybe when we have the singularity. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> maybe there's some uh, computer scientists who would. AGI will solve this. Yeah, could, could happen, of course. Okay, let's leave it at that, but uh, as a final treat to the audience, let's play a Blitz game. You mentioned you uh, give time odds to even grandmasters. I'm just a candidate master, so one minute against five minutes. Sure, yeah, let's okay. do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, let's start. Let's see how long I survive. <laughs> okay, let's go. Okay. Just five seconds. <laughs> no chance for me, probably. Forgot about that one. Almost fell into the trap. <laughs> it's not good for me. <laughs> 
Okay. Is it game over already? <laughs> okay, I give up. <laughs> Thank you for the game. This was Fabiano Caruana and uh, his impressive skills. I almost tricked him. G G3, I was cool. Uh, I didn't. No, at first, I was like, what, what is this move about? But then, <laughs> yeah, okay. almost got me. One, one, one trick in my arsenal. Thank you very much Thank for you. the insightful discussion. Please subscribe to C Squared Podcast, my favorite podcast. The link is in the description. And see you in the next episodes with Yanni Pomnishi, Levon Aronian, and many other chess players. Bye bye.